Good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us this evening. Um, Youth Policy Forum is an educational and policy advocacy platform that offers young people the opportunity to learn about governance and its many dimensions from leading experts in the field spanning different sectors and political parties. Today's webinar on the upcoming Paris Summit for a new global climate uh, Global Financing Pact is the second in a two-part series organized by YPF. The first webinar in this series was held the day before yesterday when we held a dialogue with Bangladeshi youth climate activists to discuss the challenges they face in accessing climate finance and is available to stream on YPF's Facebook page. So please check it out if you're interested. Today, we're very excited to welcome an illustrious group of panelists to discuss Bangladesh's climate financing needs and what we can expect from the Paris Summit that will be held on the 22nd and 23rd of June this month. Um, we have with us uh, Mr. Saber Hussein Jodri, MP, Special Envoy to Prime Minister on Climate Change and YPF Governance Mentor. Um, we have Her Excellency uh, Marie Mastupuy, Ambassador of France to Bangladesh. We have with us uh, Barrister Shamim Haider Batwari, MP, MP uh, Chairperson of uh, Bangladesh Parliamentarians Caucus on Migration and Development and YPF Governance Mentor. We have with us uh, David Awal, uh, Executive Committee Member, BNP and Private Businessman and also YPF Governance Mentor. We also have with us Dr. Sebastian uh, Gros, founder, of, founder and CEO of SoulShare Inc. and Mr. Hubert Blom, uh, attache Green Inclusive Development uh, Delegation of the EU to Bangladesh. Um, welcome everyone. Again, thank you for joining. Um, so we've prepared a few questions for the panelists, but before that we've prepared a present at the YPF's environment and climate policy team has prepared a presentation so our viewers can have some context for the discussion ahead. So I will be sharing that with you right now. All right, uh, so the summit uh, will hopefully address um, the shortfall of climate finance um, and, and figure out a way to ensure that the countries that most need it in the Global South will be receiving it. Um, the summit's main objectives are to improve the fiscal space of countries facing short-term difficulties, to promote private sector development in developing nations, to incur, oh, uh, uh, Ambassador Mastipu is here, uh, to encourage investment in green infrastructure and low carbon energy transitions, and to promote innovative financing for countries vulnerable to climate change. Based on these objectives and Bangladesh's aspirations to cultivate green growth moving forward, um, our environment and climate change team has identified opportunities in Bangladesh where climate finance can be used to improve carbon and energy productivity, uh, improve material productivity, and green financing in Bangladesh. In this presentation, we'll also be discussing the systemic issues in, in climate finance flows that we hope are addressed in the summit. So first of all, um, among opportunities uh, to improve carbon and energy productivity in Bangladesh, there is immense scope to improve energy efficiency in uh, Bangladesh. Bangladesh's residential sector has an energy saving potential of 3,735 kilotons of oil equivalent um, by 2030, and its industrial sector has the potential of 2,980 uh, by 2030. Uh, in order for this, Bangladesh will need financial and capacity building support uh, to establish green building codes. And to enforce these green, green building codes, Bangladesh will need a thriving energy service company sector, um, which 
are basically companies that retrofit buildings to be energy efficient and have auditors that will audit energy consumption in industry, commercial, and residential buildings. Uh, in Bangladesh's industries, uh, need support to um, transitions to smart manufacturing, uh, which requires factory emissions monitoring and reporting facilities, uh, especially in the RMG sector. Um, it's been found that energy efficiency measures in the textile sector in Bangladesh can save 300 gigawatt hours of electricity, which increases sectoral energy efficiency by three to four percent. The main barriers that have been found in the textile sector has been uh, mobilizing adequate financing for equipment, inadequate R&D, and a lack of trained technicians and energy auditors. The next avenue where uh, carbon and energy productivity in Bangladesh can be improved is, of course, renewable energy uh, and transitioning to it. Uh, Bangladesh's current share of renewable energy in the en energy mix is only 4.5%, but Bangladesh has seen a dramatic increase in installed solar capacity in the form of solar parks and rooftop solar systems. Uh, Strata projects that by 2041, um, solar PV can account for 10% of installed capacity under a business as usual scenario, 33% uh, under a middle case scenario and 50% in a high case scenario. Uh, to achieve the high case scenario or even the middle case scenario actually, Bangladesh will need financial knowledge technical and technical support from its development partners. It will need a uh, healthy fiscal space to incentivize installation of renewable energy. It will need both public and private finance mobilization, and it will need enabling regulatory frameworks. There's also room for uh, carbon and energy productivity in Bangladesh's transport sector. Uh, so far, Bangladesh has received uh, $4.6 billion uh, for an energy efficient and low carbon transport system in uh, the North Greater Dhaka area, but this isn't enough. Um, we need interventions across the country. There's also scope for establishing vehicle fuel efficiency programs, which will require equipment and trained audit personnel. Um, a healthy fiscal space would allow for the government to offer subsidies or tax exemptions on hybrid and electric vehicles and their parts. And um, of course, financing is needed to establish charging infrastructure for electric vehicles. There's also a lot of room for um, improving energy efficiency in the agricultural sector. So far, a total of uh, 1,969 solar irrigation pumps across 25 districts have been installed, and uh, further in investment in solar irrigation pumps can achieve an energy saving potential of 173 kilotons per oil, uh, of oil equivalent by 2030. Moving on to areas where uh, Bangladesh can improve material productivity. Um, there's always room for water use efficiency in, um, text, in the textile industry. Uh, studies have found that water use efficiency measures can save up to 63 billion liters of water. Um, Bangladesh has laws for industries to install effluent treatment plants, but the equipment uh, needed is, isn't um, locally available and import taxes are very high. So a subsidy or grant scheme would be needed for industries to comply with the law, existing law. Um, there's also scope for uh, establishing further recycling facilities. Uh, Bangladesh has a very successful 
example of a recycling facility in Joshua, which was financed by uh, the ADB, German Development Bank and Swedish Development Cooperation Agency. And it can be replicated in other areas as well. Um, our youth leaders pointed out the other day that there is scope for um, expanding plastic to bricks enterprises, which basically repurpose um, plastic to make uh, bricks for construction. Um, there's also scope for uh, installing uh, waste to energy plants. It was actually announced yesterday that a 42.5 megawatt plant will be developed in Amin Bajar in Shabar. Um, in partnership with China. However, um, there's still some, uh, there are still some doubts over whether uh, waste energy plants are actually environmentally friendly and if they um, produce less carbon emissions than traditional fossil fuel plants. So there is more research and development needed in that area. Moving on to uh, how finance in Bangladesh can be green. Uh, Bangladesh already has a green refinance scheme, um, which offers an interest rate what, that's 1% less than bank rates uh, for uh, green products, projects, and initi initiatives. Uh, the scheme, which was uh, originally started in 2009, uh, covered 10 products at first, but has now, but now covers uh, 50 products in uh, 11 green categories, including renewable energy, energy efficiency, solid and liquid waste management, recycling, etc. International finance, knowledge, and technology support can help make the scheme available to more borrowers. There is also a need in Bangladesh for insurance and other risk sharing mechanisms to encourage investment in green sectors like renewable energy that require high upfront costs and businesses may be nervous to um, embark on. International assistance can subsidize premiums on these insurance schemes. There's also a need for weather index insurance for crops, livestock, and fisheries. And there's a need for microfinance and other forms of financial support uh, for climate vulnerable cottage, <clears throat> small and medium enterprises in both rural and urban areas. Uh, now, now that we've uh, discussed the opportunities, I'd like to move on to the systemic issues in climate finance flows that we hope are addressed by both the government and by the global community. Um, because YPF is a youth platform, I'll start off with the issues that were encountered by the youth leaders we spoke to the other day. Um, first, uh, they found that most adaptation assistance to Bangladesh is very Dhaka-centric. Um, there's an urgent need for comprehensive vulnerability uh, mapping across Bangladesh so that uh, aid reaches areas that need it, apart from Taka. There's also been a communication gap between local researchers and the government and international donors that need to be bridged. Um, the youth leaders also found that there's not enough policy or budgetary support for youth development. Um, international grants, which are difficult for governments to access, are even more inaccessible for fledgling youth organizations who don't have the credentials or know how to meet strict application criteria. Um, they've the youth led leaders, the youth leaders we spoke to said that there's a need for knowledge and capacity building support to raise funds and apply for grants. And um, there's a need for inclusive training uh, in evidence based writing. Uh, they also raised the issue that the grants and other funds that they can access are heavily taxed by the government of Bangladesh. Um, they, and in addition to that, they asked for more in 
interaction between uh, private sector entities and youth-led organizations. And um, they pointed out that corporations need further encouragement to use their CSR funds to support climate initiatives. Uh, they also mentioned that uh, CSME-led green innov innovations like the plastic to bricks uh, enterprises were not receiving enough government support and pr public or private investment. Moving on to uh, systemic issues at the country and international level, overall, there is not enough adaptation financing. Uh, according to Bangladesh's most recent, recent national adaptation plan, implementing 113 identified adaptation interventions requires uh, approximately $230 billion between 2023 and 2050. Uh, the National Adaptation Plan has identified eight uh, key priority sectors, um, but what our youth leaders pointed out was that um, adaptation projects that uh, isolate sectors aren't really effective and that they need to be tailored to the needs of specific um, geographic locations uh, and take a more multi-sector approach. Uh, the government of Bangladesh's climate relevant budget allocations have only increased by 1.1% between uh, 2015 and 2022 from uh, USD 1.4 billion to three point, uh, roughly $3 billion. Um, you can see the stark gap between what is being spent and what is needed. Um, there's a need to improve fiscal space to increase budget allocations to the relevant ministries and agencies. And there's also a need for our um, climate advocates and diplomats to renegotiate and restructure existing development loans. Uh, one option that we hope that they explore is the debt for climate swaps, where instead of paying off external debts in foreign currencies, those payments can be redirected in, in local currency towards domestic climate projects. Um, here you can see that uh, Bangladesh has technically has uh, access to a number of uh, global climate funds. However, um, the amount isn't a lot uh, compared to our needs. It's in the millions, where our, whereas our needs are in the billions. And this is, again, because um, our organizations don't have the capacity to meet existing criteria. So we need the capacity building support to meet existing fund approval criteria, but we also need more lenient approval criteria to access international funds. And finally, um, something that we hope that our diplomats uh, will advocate for is this, uh, the establishment of standardized definitions for what counts as adaptation assistance and for the creation of a climate finance tracking mechanism. So uh, adaptation aid is often indistinguishable from regular development aid uh, due to a lack of uh, such a definition. And this has led to fossil fuel and other high emissions projects being categorized as climate assistance. Uh, it's led to concerns of adaptation coming at the expense of regular development aid. And it's uh, led to concerns of donor countries overreporting their adaptation aid outflows. Um, so what would be helpful is a global adaptation finance tracking system and, and that would build trust between donor and recipient countries. This tracking system would have to include uh, project level metadata, such as project summaries, itemized budgets, georeferencing, uh, uh, assessment, uh, project 
uh, social and environmental assessments, et cetera, uh, that would help determine the project's relevance to climate change. And of course, Bangladesh needs to be uh, a part of the, creating this track, uh, needs to contribute to this tracking system by uh, developing the administrative will. And, and if the, I can request you to uh, wrap it up in one minute, I think that would yeah, be yeah, yeah. I'm done. Minute. Yeah, so, so uh, Bangladesh will need to uh, develop the administrative will and capacity to uh, conduct uh, impact assessments, be it environmental or socioeconomic assessments, to uh, contribute to these uh, to this tracking system. And uh, I think that's all we had. Uh, so um, yeah, so now that that's done. Uh, if anybody has any questions right now, then I will move on to. Uh, the, questions to the panelists. Any questions? Okay. Um, so uh, I'll move on to our panelists right now. I understand that um, Ambassador Mastupui has to run in a bit. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask her uh, first. I'll ask her a question first. Uh, Good evening, Ambassador. Also, be nice if all the um, all, all the panelists turn on their cameras so we can see everyone. Yes. Hi, Ambassador. Oh, this is the audio is not working. Okay. Well, in case I have to leave. I think uh, what we can do is maybe we can go to uh, maybe we can go to other panelists and try to fix this. Uh, like you know, yeah. meanwhile. Yeah. Um, all right. So I guess uh, I will uh, turn to Mr. Saber Hussein Chaudhry then. Uh, Mr. Jyoti, what terms and conditions will Bangladesh be pursuing at the summit? And what outcomes do you hope to see at the summit and uh, at COP later this year? Thank you. And uh, can you hear me? Audible? Yes. Um, so uh, thank you to Youth uh, Policy Forum for organizing this and all of the distinguished panelists um, who are gathered here this evening. Uh, I know it's a holiday in Bangladesh, so uh, the fact that uh, so many people are taking time to be here is uh, much appreciated. Uh, I hope uh, Her Excellency the Ambassador can, can hear me because uh, France, of course, uh, has come forward with this initiative. And I think what we should first of all acknowledge is that this uh, renewed interest in the whole issue of uh, climate finance is very welcome. Uh, it comes at a time, of course, when the world is uh, is facing the impacts of climate change, whether it's the floods in, in northern Italy or, you know, a wildfire from uh, from Canada moving on to New York, or what is happening in Bangladesh and other parts. So we now realize how critical the situation is, and this event is also coming at a time when there seems to be uh, a lack of everything whether it is lack of cooperation, lack of solidarity, uh, lack of delivering on promises, lack of ambition. Um, uh, it seems to everything, you know, uh, lack is in abundance. And of course, this is not something that we want to see. And because of this, we are now in a situation where we have a number of uh, converging crises. So whether it is uh, the existential challenge of climate change, it is the uh, loss of biodiversity, uh, the war on nature that continues to be waged. And of course, at a time when we also have our development aspirations to look at. So increasingly, we are being forced in a situation where it's becoming either or. Uh, do we look after the people of Bangladesh? Do we address their vulnerabilities? Do we stand by the poor people? Do we ensure their basic necessities? Do we continue on the development trajectory? Or or do we respond to the change, uh, to the climate change agenda? So I think it's it's a very difficult time. And uh, uh, so the summit is certainly very welcome. You know, I think the road to Paris, as you have labeled it, uh, is something that we welcome. 
But of course, it is what we take back from Paris, which is going to be important. Uh, whether it is going to change the trajectory of uh, global solidarity and global cooperation, I think that's a very big, uh, very big issue. I'm framing it at a very uh, micro, at a very macro level because I think this is important. You know, we can go into the details of what Bangladesh can do in terms of energy efficiency, uh, but we know that if you look at the track record, um, the targets as well as the delivery on finance has been literally abysmal. You know, it's, it's pitiful what has happened. Um, so we are still uh, looking at the 100 billion, uh, which incidentally wasn't uh, done on any scientific basis. From what I understand, when the negotiations were going on, I think it was um, George uh, Brown, who was the UK prime minister, and he said, okay, let's propose $100 billion. And that 100 billion, even if it were to be met, would be nowhere near adequate. You know, when you talk uh, globally, we listen to our uh, colleagues from Africa and other places, you're looking at trillions, literally, every year. And, uh, and we know that uh, the world has not been able to find that kind of money, even when it comes to the SDGs. I know it is nowadays quite fashionable to talk about the crisis in Ukraine, um, you know, and we talk about COVID. But the fact of the matter is, we were not able to deliver, even when times were good. Uh, the SDG had a shortfall of $2.4 trillion uh, even before all of these uh, crises came in. But we seem to find a way to bail out banks and financial institutions, but we are not willing to bail out nature and our own future. So I think this is um, a very important uh, summit. And we certainly thank uh, President Macron of, of France for having taken the initiative. He's at least, you know, he's asking the questions. And I think uh, we are just accepting non-performance and non-delivery as business as usual, which it simply cannot be. You know, we have to stand up. International commitments have to be on it. And as I've said, you know, whether it is finance, whether it is technology, whether it is emissions, um, the latest uh, statement from the UN Secretary General is talking about a temperature rise of 2.8 degrees Celsius. Uh, forget about 1.5. You know, we are at 1.1 now, so it's going to more than double. And uh, that's going to be outright catastrophe, outright disaster. So how do we scale up finance? That is, of course, there. And it has to be relevant to the needs. So assessment of needs is very important. You know, we talk about a few billion here and a few billion there. Uh, you were in your presentation talking about the National Adaptation Plan of Bangladesh uh, between 2023 and 2050. And in just 70, uh, sorry, 27 years, we are talking about $230 billion. Now, remember, that is on the basis of a 1.1 or a 1.2 degree rise in temperature. But if it is going to be more, then that cost also goes up. So if Bangladesh, just as one country, uh, needs that amount. And of course, we all know about you know, climate justice, uh, having, been, um, having contributed at least to the problem, we are the most impacted. Our emissions are not even 0.5%, not even 1%, not even 0.5%, 0.4%, and we are the most impacted. So I think this, um, the, the new global financing pact that we are looking at um, is going to be extremely challenging, but the questions have to be asked, the hard questions have to be asked. And what Bangladesh would be looking for is we don't want to be in a situation of either or, you know, in terms of our development needs, in terms of standing by the marginalized and vulnerable people, and climate change. So it not, should not be either or. We should be able to do that all together. So climate, nature, development, you know, everything has to come together. Poverty reduction, that is what we are looking at. Um, so scaling up in terms of ambition, in terms of delivery. Um, the other thing I think is, you know, it's not just Bangladesh, it's also other countries. At a time when fiscal space is uh, shrinking rapidly, uh, we, don't find it, we don't want to see financial flows that are going to increase the debt burden. I think that is absolutely fundamental. You know, the, just to get out of this hole, we don't want to dig a bigger hole in the process. So how can we make sure that the financing flows that are coming through are grants? Um, now, I know there's a lot of talk about, you know, mobilizing private finance. And of course, private finance is important, but it can never be a substitute for public funds. You know, and we have seen from our experience that private finance gets all excited when it comes to mitigation because there is a bottom line. But it's extremely difficult, extremely challenging to monetize adaptation. You know, how do you show 
a financial return on adaptation. So public finance is always going to shy away from this. So I think ba what Bangladesh is really looking at in very broad terms is how do we build trust uh, through, the, uh, through this Paris initiative? Because I think, you know, if you don't have trust, uh, then whatever we try to build is only going to be a house of cards, which is going to collapse at any time. So we are certainly looking for global solidarity. We are looking for the countries to come together. And uh, there is a tag that is given to countries like Bangladesh that we are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So imagine uh, a typical river scene in Bangladesh. And we see paintings, we see pictures, videos, and you will see many boats. Some are fishing boats, some are carrying people, some are carrying cargo. And uh, if Bangladesh is the first boat to sink, mm -hmm. all other boats in the river are going to sink. So it's a question of when, not if, when all countries become vulnerable. And I think this is the challenge we have. This is the message that Bangladesh would like to make. We have done remarkably well as a country. We continue to, uh, to progress. And even the way we look at the climate issue, you know, we think we are not just victims, uh, but we are also part of the solution. Uh, and if you look at the Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan, which is what I will end with, uh, I know it's almost 70 billion plus in terms of, uh, of uh, financial requirements. There we are trying to move from vulnerability mm -hmm. to resilience to prosperity. And I think that is Bangladesh uh, giving a message to the world that we are not just victims, but we would actually like to be part of the solution and a leader. Thank you. Mr. Chudi, I'd like to ask you one more question. Um, it's what is Bangladesh, is Bangladesh building any uh, international coalitions and what is it doing to um, be uh, for it to be a more play a more prominent role in global climate change negotiations? You know, uh, we are constrained to an extent by the way the UNFCCC process is structured, mm -hmm. because there you've got some groups. I mean, Climate Fun uh, Vulnerable Forum is not a negotiating group or mm -hmm. block within the UNFCCC. We belong to G77 China. We are also aligned to the uh, NDCs. But we feel that the small island developing states, you know, they are our natural allies. A lot of the LDC countries are, are aligned with Bangladesh. But the problem, and I will say it again, I've said it in the past, is the, the premise of the UNFCCC system. You know, it is consensus. And I'm sorry to say, but consensus, which should be a privilege in context of multilateralism, is actually being abused by some countries. So you literally have to have all 194 countries agree on every word of a document. If one country disagrees, then the whole thing is, is, uh, is no longer an agreement. And so what happens at a time when we are talking about higher, greater levels of ambition, we are working on the basis of the lowest common denominator. That means we have a watered down agreement, which everyone can accept. And I think the question that we are asking or will be asking in Paris to what extent is the international financial institution or the ecosystem fit for purpose? You know, a lot of people are saying that we have to look at a new structure, uh, look back at what, what happened with the Bretton Woods, and now do we come up with uh, new structures? The multilateral development banks have to uh, increase their appetite. I think we also have to ask to what extent is the current UNFCCC process fit for purpose? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, my next question is for uh, Barrister Shamim Haider. Uh, is he here? Is he not here? Um, I think he was. Uh, he was saying that he's facing some, like, you know, power short. Oh, okay. Maybe okay. you can go to the other speakers. All right. Uh, sure. Um, so, uh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, uh, this question is for um, those who are involved with the private sector. How can, how can Bangladesh mobilize more private capital for its green sectors? Mr. Dabidawa? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I just, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, YPF for organizing um, this discussion and roundtable online. I'd also like this opportunity to uh, 
congratulate and support Mr. Sabar and Choudhury, uh, Member of Parliament, uh, for his uh, you know untiring efforts to do what he's doing, not just for Bangladesh but globally in terms of climate uh, vulnerability efforts. So for for the private sector side. I just have a few few comments that I can make in, in general, uh, because I mean, how much relevant I can be more towards Paris, more in the global context, uh, I'm not sure. But in Bangladesh, nothing like the rest of the world, the private sector has basically two um, aspects of financing, right? One is that if they are directly involved in climate oriented business, which could be recycling, reprocessing, um, you know, or just handling, uh, you know, polluted environment. Um, there is a little bit of financing for that, a little bit of uh, grants for that. But end of the day, you know, when you when you take on some of the bureaucratic processes uh, to access that finance, uh, one asks themselves a question that, uh, you know, is it worth it or not? Um, and a lot of the finance in Bangladesh, because of traditional activity, has been restricted to SME, SME models, small, medium enterprises. But to be honest, when you're tackling you know, climate related environments uh, like plastic pollution, air pollution in some cases, if that's an issue, water pollution, the area is so vast and so big, it requires huge amounts of actually financing. Uh, so treating it like an SME, it, it doesn't work. Um, but, and that's the mindset we kind of have to come out of as well as we are creating these types of financing policies. Second part of uh, climate financing for Bangladesh, the private sector faces is, transition as you present in your um, in your presentation. So when someone's investing in transition, unfortunately, they're not being able to invest in capacity building, products enhancing, efficiency. So it doesn't really uh, help on the bottom line or help on the profitability. Um, but what it does, it adds to cost of interest. It adds to cost of debt. And as the Honorable Parliament has said that we are looking for more soft financing or grant finan uh, finances. But when you're adding debt to just trans transition from, you know, from something more climate friendly, whether it be our supply chain energy, whether it be our packaging, whether it be even, you know, sourcing of, of more, uh, you know, responsible materials, it just doesn't, you know, work at the end of the day. And then you become basically non-competitive and you become basically a defaulter in, in many cases. So that is just the two two scenarios that uh, you know that I'd like to share from the private sector of, of of Bangladesh. But the other part is that you know we and and you know I asked YPF and an and honourable member of parliament also to bring this up in Paris if possible. That you know just at trying to have a sectoral approach. Uh, so let's, let's say in any textile industry, just trying to make the you know the textile recycled yarn or the water to be more uh, on you know. Uh, influent under influent plan is not going to work either. We need the whole supply chain to be climate conscious. We need the whole supply chain from you know the grower to the processor to the manufacturer to the buyer. End of the day, uh, to be you know climate climate responsive and to be part of the solution and and not just have a you know feel good uh, experience in purchasing something, but actually to be part of that experience when purchasing something. So I'm really restricting in I guess production oriented uh, opportunities but that's my background and that's what i can you know discuss more in details hence i uh, mentioned that and the other aspect maybe not private sector but a suggestion as a as a concerned citizen and as an advocate from bangladesh side to you know ipf and to the bangladesh team who go to paris is that it, it's true we we all understand that getting a global consensus to have everyone on board and everyone committed and everyone you know uh, on this uh, supply chain is, uh, is is tasking and is hard. Uh, but I would like to suggest to Bangladesh that, you know, it's time to basically, if we have any, you know, thing, we, actions we have, we can showcase, uh, we should showcase those. Just presenting policies, I don't think is gonna win too many hearts and minds, but when we actually show our progress and showcase some action items, uh, it does win hearts and minds. And if not globally, Bangladesh should also look at, you know, regional alliances, sub-regional alliances, bilateral alliances, maybe uh, with some, some of the small islands in the Pacific to really show that there is progress within our region or our bilateral alliances, which can maybe put pressure on the global uh, affairs as well. Um, there's no one, one solution for everything, but all we can do is keep trying. 
um, and uh, you know, and hope that we, you know, just get better than we were yesterday. Thank you for now. Thank you. Um, Dr. Gro, would you like to add something? Sure, Anjan. Let me try to build on what uh, um, Mr. Chaudhary and Mr. Awal just said. I just picking out that sentence, which Mr. Chaudhary said twice, is to position Bangladesh not just as a victim, but really as part of the solution. And also this showcasing that uh, uh, Tabit was uh, just mentioning. And I'll, I'll put it in the perspective of a climate tech startup as I represent here with, with, with Solskjaer. I think what we need to recognize is that innovation can come from anywhere in the world. And um, the easiest to uh, we do that to realize that is just say, okay, in order to build a great product, you, we usually say you need to have great empathy. You need to be very close to the problem. Now we also heard that Bangladesh is as close to the problem as one might get, given that it's one of the most vulnerable countries to the negative impacts of climate change. So it's, it's just logic that uh, Bangladesh also has come up and will come up with a solution or two, which is worth looking into, scaling up to in Bangladesh, but possibly also replicating. And I think that's this showcasing that that uh, 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 Tabit was alluding to, as well as Sarabai was showing that this is part of the solution, I think, and that is important. Um, but yet, if we look at the landscape of the climate tech startups, we really should have, you know, 10 sole shares by now. We should have a lot more in the climate tech startup space. And there's a bit of a thirst. And I think that needs to be that needs to be addressed. And um, because climate investment, and I, I do speak now about the, the, uh, the private sector part, the private sector investment, it comes to where it is conducive, right? And I think there's two things. One is you need to have a, a good deal flow, which means we need a bunch of really, really good climate tech startups. That's number one. But number two, also conducive also means usually in the political environment. And the, I guess there's also some homework to do. The current budget, which is proposed, has how many new fiscal incentives for renewable energies? None. There's nothing in it. And that's that's not a good sign. This is what investors ask, right? The, that is problematic. I think the, the Muji Prosperity Plan is a fantastic piece of policy. But then again, the energy sector uh, uh, system power master plan is not in line with the Muji plan. So there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a disconnect. And that often then leads to, when I speak to investors, whenever they see this inconsistency that causes problem that downgrades again, Bangladesh as a ranking, as a, as a good uh, destination to receive investment or climate finance for that matter. So I think these, these are very, very important elements. And, just to, to put one more as an example, we had this event this week uh, where the energy advisor came and we said, look, we have 3 million electric vehicles in Bangladesh. First, of course, in terms of showcasing, um, the energy advisor said that this is 3 million Teslas. Bangladeshi Tesla said it's more than Tesla has sold globally. That is great. Now, unfortunately, those vehicles run on lead acid batteries. So we, we, we showed if we switch that to lithium iron, that would have a bunch of uh, advantages. Among them, we basically save a power coal power plant just in energy efficiency. But importing those batteries is 60% duty. So, and there's no option to get it locally. So it cannot be a protective measure because there's nothing we can do. The maximum is we can assemble it here, but for the cells, we have the same duty. So these are the kind of pieces, if we bring down that duty, in a welching will happen, the market case is clear. We have 3 million vehicles. Each battery is $1,600. That's a $4.5 billion market, and it's profitable. I think these things, I think we need to promote more and have more wins, and then more investors will come. Thank you, Dr. Gro. Uh, I'm going to jump to Barrister Shamim Haider. Uh, well, Anjum, I, Anjum, I think, I think oh. Sabirbhai wants to respond to this. Okay, okay. Sure. So maybe Sabirbhai can go, and then we can go to the other speaker. Yes, yes. thank you. Thank you. No, Sebastian, you are, you are right. I mean, uh, uh, there is, we need to have uh, policy coherence and we need to be consistent. Um, if we have the Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan, then all other plans should be in, an, in alignment with it, as you have said, you know, the integrated energy and power master plan is not yet final. We are aware of this. We are bringing it up. And I think also to refer back to what Tabith was saying, uh, I think 
we really have to look at renewables, uh, sustainability, uh, not just as uh, something that we are doing, which is good for nature, but this has to be, the bottom line has to be positive. You know, there has to be a very strong business case. Uh, this is not an agenda for corporate social responsibility. This should be front and center. So I think what we are looking for is how do we make the business case for investment, Bangladeshi investment, private sector investment, in sustainability and renewable energy. I think that's, you know, so I mean, just to give you one example, when we are talking about plastics, and, you know, I was talking to Unilever and uh, other organizations, we were saying that what if we give you an incentive if uh, the plastics that you manufacture or the containers that you make must contain 60% recycled material, you know, things, something like that. So there are ways and means of encouraging, and what we need is more of that. And uh, Tabit will probably agree that, you know, what we really need, I mean, the Bangladesh private sector, I mean, look at the size of our uh, capital markets. It's not going to solve all the problems. We need to have international financial institutions come in. And I think what we are looking for in Bangladesh and in other countries, if you're trying to incentivize the private sector, is for the multilateral development banks to de-risk the investment. You know, how can they take an exposure? So you take the element of risk out. Of course, in any business, there will be an element of risk. That's why people go into business, because the higher the risk, the higher the reward. But if we can get the multilateral development banks to de-risk investment, and I think this should be a major agenda in Paris, you know, then you will see that there's a lot of private sector investment, not just from within Bangladesh, but also from other countries. And to Tabit's other point, yes, I think regional cooperation is important. And just to give you one, we are looking at the Sundarbans as one ecological unit. So you must have joint management, joint conservation. Thank God, you know, the Royal Bengal Tiger doesn't need a visa to go from Bangladesh to India or from India to Bangladesh. But that is how we need to have regional cooperation. And that will then form the basis of, of a global building block. Thank you. No, I just wanted to, because the discussion was on and I'm not sure whether I'll be back. Anju, I think I think this is this is something that we should allow a discussion between the panelists because that makes it more interesting. Uh, Savirbhai, I just also want to briefly mention that Ajoy Banga, the new World Bank president who just got recently appointed, yes. uh, he's coming to the Paris summit. And uh, in his last uh, interview with Farid Zakaria and CNN GPS, he mentioned about like de-risking investment on on like you know green. So I think I think uh, this is an agenda that you definitely push, and that is uh, Paris summit would probably be a good time for that. Uh, Anju, over to you. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to uh, jump to Barrister Shamim Haider now. Uh, so uh, Bangladesh is expected, is, is he still here? Did we lose him? Oh, we lost him. Okay. Yeah, I think we lost him. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, we'll, we'll wait for when he uh, comes back. Is everyone else here? It's gotten very yes, quiet. Yes. Um, so okay. maybe, maybe we can go okay. to uh, Mr. Hubert Bloom uh, for yes. his view. Yes. Um, so Mr. Bloom, um, please tell us like what role do you see the EU playing in uh, global efforts to increase climate finance and to ensure that it reaches the countries who need it the most? Thank you. That is, uh, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Honored to be here today, and thank you very much for for bringing me to this very important audience today. After all, um, the Youth Policy Forum, you are the decision makers for the future. Um, so thank you. On, on the question, um, yes, what is the EU doing? Um, I mean, EU internally, like we have like our climate change ambitions are captured in what we call our Green Deal. Our Green Deal is like by 2050, we want to be a climate neutral economy. Um, we cannot do that alone and we have no will to do it alone. We want to take a responsibility. So we have an, an external dimension there. EU and member states are currently the biggest funders of ODA um, and the biggest funded of climate finance. So we are stepping up to our commitment. Um, I hear the words of the Honorable uh, Member of Parliament, Mr. Sabir Chaudhary. Yes, more can be done. We are working on it. Our efforts are there. Uh, we want to take our responsibility. 
what we can do in, in Bangladesh there, in our climate change conditions are reflected in our current cooperation in Bangladesh, which is um, our multi-annual indicative program. This is something we work on in close cooperation with um, current just from you from 2021 to 2027, it fully aligned with the current IPF plan. Um, to give a few examples from where we are working on, uh, mention was made of renewable energy. One of the priority areas we have singled out with the government of Bangladesh is renewable energy. Currently, through a global gateway approach, which is the name for our innovative um, major infrastructure projects. We are currently working on a blended financing product, 45 million in grants, 350 million in blended loan on renewables alone. Um, that is one of the current activities we're working on in delivering climate change mitigation efforts. Um, other activities we are currently working on. Mention was made on how to deliver um, climate change adaptation uh, adaptation efforts to a more decentralized level. We have been working with the government of Bangladesh uh, and Sweden and in, in developing two specific mechanisms to deliver de decentralized funding of climate change adaptation efforts. One for local authorities, one for communities in hard to reach areas. Um, it is something which is working quite fine. The ambition is also for the government of Bangladesh to scale it up. Um, we are com currently coming to an end on our current phase, but the ambitions are big. Um, there are just two examples of where we are working on and where we, how we aim to, to improve climate finance for Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, so uh, I think we have Barrister Shamim Haider with us again. Uh, yes. Yeah. Can, I, can I say something? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm in, a, in the midst of very huge um, catastrophe and um, the electricity is gone and the um, support is not enough. And also Wi-Fi is disturbing very much. Am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, YPA, for ending such a wonderful um, event uh, with so many luminaries, so many experts. Um, definitely when it comes to climate disaster, climate financing or vulnerability, uh, it's not mere academic when it comes to Bangladesh. Um, almost 20% of Bangladesh is that Bangladesh land is at peril of extinction um, in the near future. One fourth of is in constant risk of being climate refugee. So the climate disaster is not climate change. I think we should. Um, to be. Yes, sir, hi there. Are you still there? Okay, we've, we've lost him again. So, Anju, meanwhile, we've been receiving questions. Um, yes. Already. So, I, I'm like, there is one good question from uh, Mohammed Sakib Khaled. Maybe we can start with that. Yeah. Uh, so, this is for uh, Mr. Tabi Dawal. Uh, from a purely business perspective, do you also see the increased global focus on climate change as an opportunity for Bangladeshi businesses to technologically leapfrog and gain better market share in the global market? Also, do you see enough awareness among private sector actors to adapt to the changing landscape? Yes, thank you. Uh, to be very uh, upfront, that you know, Bangladesh and Bangladeshis are actually one of the most innovative and resilient uh, you know, people uh, when it comes to actually business. So the awareness of climate change and the commitment towards climate change is actually a huge opportunity for Bangladesh. It's a huge opportunity, both in leapfrogging in you know, use of technology, um, what's out there, but also in actually you know, accessing global markets because as global markets are demanding more 
responsible or climate conscious products, Bangladesh can you know be part of that product uh, and actually you know um, you know uh, uh, engage in market share, uh, not just in textiles for many other products uh, that any consumer may need. And the follow up question, which was in terms of the local business and our awareness, unfortunately, no. Uh, un unfortunately, um, a lot of the local Bangladesh business uh, enterprises uh, are seeing either uh, climate change as just a necessity right now, adapting to climate change, or um, kind of uh, something that's being added on, uh, just trying to be compliant or trying to be, you know, you know, get some sort of a contract. Uh, but the 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 idea of you know we should be climate responsible in doing business anyways in everyday activity that awareness is still not there. Uh, not that it's zero; it's it's happening, and uh, thanks to organizations uh, like you know YPF, it is better. But we are we are short of what our aspirations are on that situation. Thank you. Okay, I want to build on that, and um, I want to ask the entire panel. How do we go about building more uh, awareness about green businesses? And how do we improve capacity building at various stages, starting from um, the application for a grants pro process to implementation process? How do we go about improving capacity building and awareness? So if I can just uh, come on to that, you know, because this was also in the slide. <clears throat> so accessing finance has always been a challenge, not just for Bangladesh, you know, for many of the developing countries. And I think the one is the amount of time it takes, and the other is the you know the process being extremely complicated. And I don't wish to name any countries, but you will see that two or three countries are virtually monopolizing most of the funding. Um, whereas if you look at it in terms of, you know, the impacts that Bangladesh faces, it should be a lot more. So I think making finance more accessible is obviously going to be a key area of focus. And of course, capacity building, you know, I think that is, that is also important. Um, awareness um, in terms of uh, the private sector, yes, I think that's a challenge. But if I can just also quickly go back to a question you had asked me about uh, coalitions and partnerships. And we have uh, Mr. Blom here. I think uh, you know after Paris, you also have the uh, the Climate uh, Ambition Summit. You know you have the Special Summit, and then you have the COP28 in Dubai. I would actually like to see Bangladesh, along with other vulnerable countries, have a coalition with the European Union. And I think the European Union, if you look at the traditional or the historic uh, process within the COP, uh, one of the reasons why Paris agreement happened uh, during the Paris COP is because it was USA, China, and the European Union coming together. So I think when we are trying to you know, move the needle, when we are trying to make uh, breakthroughs, this coalition is going to be very important. You know, the Danish uh, minister was in town, I saw him uh, two days ago. And so we were talking about how the European Union can help. And one of the specific areas where we can work together now we are talking about all of these investments, we are talking about uh, tracking climate finance, but we don't have a definition of climate finance. You know, so we are, uh, someone is saying that um, 85 billion has been disbursed, but if you look at someone like Oxfam, they'll say it's actually less than 10 billion. So there is uh, duplication, there is double counting, uh, there is ODA, which is perhaps repackaged as climate finance. So let us get the basics right. You know, let us also define adaptation. Let us ensure that uh, uh, loss and damage is funded. And on that, you know, I, I have a particular point from Bangladesh, and that is that we shouldn't just be looking at loss and damage funding. We have to scale up adaptation for which we need funds so that the limit to uh, loss and damage is not crossed. You know, so loss and damage is what? It's about averting, it's about minimizing, and it's about avoiding. Uh, or responding to. So responding to is the only aspect which is related to loss and damage. The averting, minimizing is to do with mitigation and adaptation. So let us get this conceptual clarity. And I think that's where, you know, Bangladesh and the European Union can also work very closely together. Sorry, I, I had to take this opportunity because you are here. So I, uh, I said those uh, things. Mr. Blunt. 
Thank you very much. And again, I hear you, Honourable Member of Parliament. Um, we'll have an opportunity to cooperate. Um, uh, we have had last year, I'm, I'm very sp specific now, uh, last year we've had the EU-Bangladesh Joint Committee. We've had uh, a political dialogue, the first ever between the countries. Within the framework of those discussions, we, uh, the government of Bangladesh, and the European Union agreed to launch a bilateral dialogue on climate change. Uh, something I am sincerely hoping it will happen in the short term, where we can actually discuss on how we can have a closer cooperation about our um, engagement uh, in the national arena, because that is what it is. It is an arena. Um, you have given us some very valuable insights on what is actually happening between countries and the wrangling that is taking place there. Um, I think it is very pertinent that a, a, a block of countries like the European Union and Bangladesh get together. Um, I have worked for quite some time in the WTO and, the, and that's already quite some time ago, the Doha Development Round, where you exactly saw the same thing happening where you would see developing countries operating a block, the most powerful countries operating together, um, developing countries in different sizes and flavors coming together. But um, the one thing you did see enough was actually countries crossing the borders, crossing the line and seeing how they could cooperate further. So um, I um, very much appreciate this open question. Uh, we are willing to take on that. Um, we will have our bilateral dialogue and we can discuss that further. In the dialogue, um, I'm sure we will use the opportunity also to see how we can work on better innovative practices. Um, one thing that was mentioned before in the question on private sector development. One thing I would genuinely see, like to see is closer cooperation between the European Union and Bangladesh on how to share best practices and best technologies. Um, yes, I mean, I've been here now for about a year. One thing I did notice is that Bangladesh is highly entrepreneurial, um, extremely business-minded with a massive innovative capacity. Um, I would love to see how European businesses, European technological institutes can get together and work with Bangladesh Institute in seeing how we can promote and develop greener products. Um, two remarks, therefore, on, on a dialogue and on innovative capacity. One final point on, on um, how to promote greener products here in Bangladesh. Um, one of the questions was on green funding, uh, green uh, financing. As already mentioned in your presentation, dear moderator, you mentioned that we do have a facility. Uh, the Bangladesh Bank manages a facility for, for uh, green products. As I understand it, it's currently underutilized. Uh, depending on the sector and the product, it's working fine and less fine depending on. Um, I think a closer look should be taken in how and which products are actually taken up by the market and where more could be done, that for one. Secondly, on multilateral engagement, I think it's quite important as well that the multilateral financial institutions um, take a good look at what actually the market demands. Bottom line of all of that is there need to be a closer engagement between private sector development partners, government of Bangladesh in seeing how we can better adapt our products for the market. More than anything else, I think it's quite important that we look at um, that there is a closer engagement also with government in seeing where the limits of the market are and where governments should intervene. I think it's quite important that on issues which uh, Mr. Sebastian Goy already mentioned, there are limitations where the market can operate government will need to set the boundaries and need to enforce these so that private sector knows in which remit they can operate. Um, thank you.
Uh, Anju, I think uh, Sebastian raised yeah, his hand. Mr. Mr. I also yeah. want to add a question because Shamim Bhai was briefly mentioning about it, but since he got disconnected. So, um, uh, Savir Bhai, uh, Tavid Bhai and others, I think one issue that is important is climate change induced migration that is happening in Bangladesh, right? And also on top of that, we have more than 1 million refugees. They're also in a region that has gone through like, you know, um, a severe transformation negatively, um, both in the ecosystem of that particular area. So how should we factor that into the climate finance negotiation um, that would happen? So maybe when you go to Sebastian, after that, uh, we can come back to this question. Yeah, I just wanted to, to pick up was uh, what Mr. Bloom said on the Bangladesh Bank that we want to, want to see what in this green lending window. So what my experience with this lending window is that um, the banks tend to play it safe, which means the products they choose to finance is usually energy efficiency, large machinery in the RMG sector, which is, you know, it's a, it's a low risk. Uh, often the energy efficiency increase is not so high because the benchmark is quite low. Um, whereas when we look at, for instance, to finance things like as simple things as rooftop solar right now, uh, what we see is there is a resistance to finance that. And even if it is, you as an entrepreneur would need to come up still with 70, 80% of a bank guarantee against that loan, which means you literally have to take the dollars. If let's say it's $5 million, you mm -hmm. have to put 80% on that onto an FDR account, a fixed deposit account, um, which is quite absurd from a from an investment mm -hmm. perspective and considering how the Taka devalues against, uh, uh, against the dollar right now. Um, so that is a challenge, but that brings us back to uh, financial instruments, which, which would be needed um, is simply to de-risk this and to give that extra incentive to, you know, from the Bangladesh bank side towards the, uh, uh, the, the, the banks to finance things, which is maybe they're not used to, and it's a little bit outside their comfort yeah. but for this, we need incentives. Dr. Gro, do you think this is because um, there is a general lack of awareness of uh, green technology among the financial institutions, or it's just because they don't want to take that risk? I think it's a chicken and egg, right? The, the, the thing is, okay, we don't know that we don't have experience with that. So we, the risk factor is perceived very high, which is, mm -hmm. which is naturally. And, but until and unless this is the risk and we collect these experience values, banks will not be able to value the risk. Right. So um, Dr. would you, uh, as, a, as a private sector entity, would you, uh, how would you like to go about this? Would it, would it be helpful to um, have a dialogue with the government on what can be done? Or do you think that the government knows that these are these problems exist? Or um, I think in this case, the government has done a good job, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's this green banking facility is there. It's, it can be tapped into. Um, I think that could possibly some uh, the, where international finance could play a role to just uh, uh, de-risk those investments. I think this is where the role of international finance should come in. Bangladesh just set the groundwork, and now um, the extra incentive needs to be added to that. Right. Okay. And we have example where it works, right? For instance, we're working with an international brand who, from the bottom line perspective, their main goal is to reduce their scope three emissions. They said, okay. Fine, Sebastian. I'll send you the dollars, put them in the account, take the loan, uh, green our supply chain. But that is rather the exception than the rule. Mm. Okay. Great. Uh, do we have any more questions from our viewers? I think there was a question from Abir from yourself with regard to yes. you know, displacement, which is. Um, yeah, it's, it's a huge problem. Uh, Tabi, did you want to say something on that first and then I can come in on displacement? Tabi? Did you want to say something, Tabi? I thought you were going to say Yes, something. sorry. I just had a network problem. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, in Bangladesh, uh, just referring to Mr. Abir's uh, comment, is, is, is I mean, we have limited space uh, and something in Bangladesh that we, we consider is we have over 1200 people per square kilometer. 
So even with the migration, where are we going to go? There, there's actually, in, in, in terms of a sovereign territory, there's really not much space left. And Bangladesh also has another challenge that we are losing agriculture land uh, due to a lot of you know, uh, climate issues. So not only do we have no place to go with our people, we also have less, less land to produce food for the same, same amount of people. And one more issue that a lot of times the data doesn't bring in is that Bangladesh is also very density wise, uh, very high density of bovine animals. So animal husbandry in Bangladesh is also very big in, in the rural areas. So your cows, your sheep, your, you know, your domestic animals also need space. They also need to you know, eat food to produce themselves as food. So Bangladesh's challenge is actually quite complex. It's not a straightforward moving people you know, from north to south or, or, or east to west. So we don't really have a choice. We have to adapt, we have to mitigate, and we have to live on the land you know, that we have. And, and, and for this, we also need the global community to reduce you know, all the, you know, the reasons behind climate change and the vulnerabilities. So um, you know, we can't mitigate everything overnight, but uh, we need to be in, this, in, in that you know, in that in that pathway. Thank you. Uh, we have a question for Mr. Jyotri. Um, is it even possible to get additional uh, international financing considering the current geopolitical landscape around the world? And what should Bangladesh do to utilize domestic resources better for climate uh, action? Yeah, before I go into that, just to uh, supplement to the good points that Tabuk made. You know, I think what uh, we are looking at, and if you look at the National Adaptation Plan, you know, one is, of course, uh, uh, resettlement, and the other is rehabilitation. And as you rightly said, you know, our density is about 1,265 people per square kilometer. So it's already one of the most densely populated countries. And at the moment, Dhaka is actually uh, taking the brunt of these uh, refugees, uh, whether you call them refugees or internally displaced people, IDPs. You know, it's the same thing. It's climate which is driving the process. And uh, the estimate from the World Bank is last year, there were over 7 million people displaced. Uh, now, of course, if you look at various scenarios, it can go up to 12 or 13 million people. So one is uh, resettling them, rehabilitating them, you know, finding job opportunities. I think Monga has already tried a few projects. And the other thing is also remember the host community that takes them in. You know, if you look at what is happening with the Rohingya um, experience, you know, so now I think the international community is focused not just on the Rohingyas, but also on the host community. The last thing you want is to have tensions, uh, you know, when people are moving in and then they are seen as a threat, especially when economic times are bad. So I think this is something which is clearly within the purview of loss and damage. You know, that is why we talk about loss and damage, because once you are uprooted from your, uh, from your land, uh, this is where your ancestors are buried, you know, this is where your, all your links are. I mean, that's it. You can't recreate that. You know, you can't recreate new burial grounds. Uh, you can't recreate a pond and a village and all the trees uh, that you live with. So that is when you go beyond adaptation, that's loss and damage. And this is clearly a case of loss and damage. And so I think this has to be treated as such, as a clear instance of, uh, of, uh, of imperative funding and financing. The scale and the extent, you know, that will depend on what are the resettlement and rehabilitation costs. But at least we have a, a very clearly agreed uh, definition there. Uh, in terms of the geopolitics, you know, I think uh, the world is changing. And uh, uh, Bangladesh, we have a foreign policy where we try to be friends with everyone. And uh, I think that is something that's going to be a constant in Bangladesh. Of course, it is difficult, if I'm being very candid, uh, to be able to maintain that line because when the when certain parts of the world think that either you are with them or you're against them, and if you're not with them, you're against them, then it makes that uh, policy very difficult to implement. But we still have to go on. And I think with the European Union, you know, the, the relationship I think is strong. There is already an existing relationship in terms of uh, the RMG. You know, this is now the, certainly the major destination. And I agree with uh, Mr. Blom that there are opportunities. So we, we have to leverage that. And uh, also in terms of our own domestic uh, resource mobilization, I think you know this is something that we have been doing. Bangladesh was the first country to launch the climate change trust fund. Uh, of course, there might be issues in terms of how we can utilize them better. There are challenges, 
but i think it's an ongoing challenge and the uh, current world environment of course makes it more challenging for us to access but that is our primary responsibility you know whether i as a public representative or or tabit or sebastian you know the ultimate responsibility is to the country and the people and their livelihoods so that is what we have to work for regardless of what the global situation is the the second part of that question was uh, what can bangladesh do to utilize domestic resources better to tackle okay. climate action first is first is you know we have to create more impact from the interventions that we are making you know we always know that we have limited resources so it is what gives you the biggest bang for the taka or the dollar or you know whatever other currency and i think here we have to change our mindsets we tend to look at uh, spending in terms of how much money has been allocated and how much has been spent rather than impact uh, assessments you know what is the impact that i have got out of the money that i have spent so it is not just building more uh, hospitals and having more classrooms it is the quality of healthcare in those hospitals and it is the quality of education in the classroom so i think we just have to change our mindset and uh, domestic resource mobilization is of course a perennial problem for bangladesh um, we if we look at the number of people who are paying tax i think that is um, criminally low uh, compared to what people are generally earning if you look at our uh, tax uh, gdp ratio uh, one of the lowest so of course there's a lot of fiscal uh, attention uh, to be given and hopefully with a new government in place whoever forms that government uh, come january I think this is going to be one of the focus domestic resource mobilization. I think um just want to add to that I think in a way we are sort of building coalition uh, through YPF here because we have representative from three major political parties so and that has been one of the objective of YPF that we have policy issues that we have common interest in and it's possible to go beyond party lines and build broader coalitions and i think one of the reason for bangladesh success till now has been the continuation of good policies and and the researchers have been now focusing on them like in subsequent governments we focused on investment in women empowerment health and others so i think climate change and uh, this sort of things would continue need to be a priority whoever from the government so that's one i have a very um, um i want to raise a question and this is basically from my research i'm working on uh, political economy of industrial policy um so there's a lot of talk on green industrial policy for developing countries for example if we look at countries like uh, south korea china when they developed or industrialized after world war 2 right uh, they still had the right to pollute um and now um like you know there is a lot of talk about green industrial policy from western researchers and many of the african countries they say that we have the fossil fuel reserves now is our time to use that and catch up and develop cheaply right so if we sort of want them to move towards green industrial policy i think they should also have the financial incentive uh coming from developed world and i think uh, we have to recognize that they also are going through a trade off that like you know catching up uh, fastly or catching up in a way that is environmentally sustainable so um should paris be a place where you also recognize this trade off and try to come up with financing that incentivizes their move towards green industrial policy recognizing uh, the cost on them absolutely i think absolutely and uh, you know i think what compensates for the fact that we don't have or we should not have the right to pollute is the advance in technology and i think as uh, mr brown mentioned what we are looking for is not just financial assistance it is also access to technology as tabit was also talking you know he was asked a question about leaf fogging so if you look at our uh, power sector for example i'm not an expert but from what i know we have the capacity to generate about 24 and a half 25000 megawatts our actual demand uh, even at peak time is probably 14 and a half 15000 so we have this buffer of 10000 megawatts to play with you know what we are actually able to generate but we have the capacity so i think that is where the leap frogging comes in because we are not in a rush you know we are not like trying to uh, get more power like yesterday so we have that cushion we have that buffer so that is what gives us the leap frog option and i think if we can embrace the latest in technology and i think this has to be a package of finance as well as technology when it comes to uh, promoting the green uh, segment or the green sector in bangladesh and that should definitely be part of paris you know when we talk about resilience nowadays 
resilience is, is green also. You know, green and resilience are coming together. And the technologies have evolved to such an extent that it is no longer an either or. You know, whether it's, is it development or is it environment? But now I think you can be environmentally responsive and sensitive and also have your development aspirations fulfilled. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Anjum, I'm just I'm mindful because Shamim Bhai could not join because yes. of our shortage, but then mm -hmm. sent a video. Shubho, um, are you able to access that? Can you play that? He requested, uh, like, you know, he wants to be a part of the conversation, so he requested yes. us to play that. So, Shubho, can we do that? No, okay, um, I have not received it yet. Okay. Uh, you haven't received it yet? Yeah, no, okay. I did not. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll do that later then. Anjum, please continue. No, but please add that on. Add that on to the video that's uh, circulated, you know, on Facebook yeah. or social media, uh, we should have that. His, his voice needs to be heard. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, so I think we're running out of time. So I'll ask one last question to the whole panel. Uh, what can Bangladesh do to foster more knowledge and technological diffusion, either uh, from the global north to the global south or, you know, south-south? I've spoken too much, so I'll just say something. <laughs> Please let somebody. David, maybe you can you can start. <laughs> okay, small small low hanging fruit is you know in Bangladesh, uh, unfortunately, um, importing technology is uh, you know uh, patented technology is thirty percent taxed. So so Bangladesh can first uh, do what it takes to lower you know the cost of just taking licensed technology. That that's just low hanging fruit. The higher hanging fruits is that you know Bangladesh um, has another uh, societal problem, if I can say, that we don't have this uh, partnership actually between our academia, which is universities and uh, colleges, and our private business houses. So the, the lacking in research sometimes, or the lacking in use of high uh, cost technology normally in, in like in Europe would be actually with the universities. And then the, the private sector would actually buy it, license it, or sometimes pay for the research if that's what's required. So Bangladesh can actually in, try and bring a partnership up where universities of Bangladesh and the world and Bangladesh's private sector can actually play a more, uh, you know, partnership role and, you know, reduce the cost and minimize the risk of, of using that, you know, technology out there. Thank you. Shubo, can you play it now? Yes, Bhaiya, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. Let's do that. Let's do that. Yes. Just give me 30 seconds. And, and after the video, maybe we can go for like you know, concluding remarks for two minutes from each of the panelists and then and then wrap it up. I think Mr. Bloom would like to say something. Just Please on go ahead. innovative capacity and thank you. Um, excuse me, I see something. All right, I will just continue. Uh, on innovative capacity, I already have answered uh, your question. Um, I think there's an important role to be played in international um, partnerships in innovative capacity, not only government to government or university to university, but also seeing how um, partnerships, strategic alliances, um, um, can be encouraged between and within private sector, between European companies, uh, companies in Bangladesh. Um, if I only look at the RNG sector, I see so much innovation coming through cooperation or small scale investment or larger scale investment um, into Bangladesh. And the transfer of technology that is taking place through that. Um, I would see that there is ample opportunity to, to scale up outside RNG and in technologies which are more relevant for, for climate change. Thank you. Um, I think we can play the video now? Yes, up here. yes I'm yep. sharing, sharing okay. this with you. Hi, good evening. Sorry for the, the, the interjection. Uh, um, I, I very unfortunately couldn't contribute live in this great event. Um, of course, when it comes to climate vulnerability, when it comes to climate disaster, when it comes to climate financing, and when it comes to Bangladesh, all together it's a very 
crucial and urgent issue for all of us. And it's not mere academic, it is, of course, uh, we time has kept to work on fact figure and on the basis of objective assessment and of target and object role we have to play. Uh, globally, it is a good time that uh, globally losing the best fund has been promised. Uh, and if you look at it for the past time, maybe, and it is important that fund is channelized to those countries in need. And obviously, it is heightened for Bangladesh, for Bangladesh youth, Bangladesh government, and Bangladesh, um, all stakeholders. We need to assess our vulnerability, uh, the degree of vulnerability we are facing at the 25% of our population are in the risk of climate change. 25% of our land are in the risk of extinction. Uh, this delta has every right to survive. This delta has every right to, uh, to survive like any other place of the land. And no, and it's happening without any fault on our part. We are not producing CG, we're not contributing for global warming, but we are facing it. And one of the biggest cause of our constant poverty is climate disaster. It's high time, create a list of uh, vulnerability, list of uh, damages that we are facing from climate, uh, from global warming, from, from CO2 emission, from, um, from our river emission, from our loss of house, loss of trees, uh, from our penal effect, uh, from our child education, to model nutrient, everything. It's high time to assess using blockchain or other technology to assess our loss. That's very important. That's important for our starting point of discussion. Then we also need to a, a group of people actively working to raise these issues in international and regional forum so that all stakeholders concerned about our laws and feel compelled to bound by the polluters pay theory and feel compelled to make a restitution theory by which uh, Bangladesh need to be restored in the position as it was before had there been this climate disaster not happened. That and we are, it is high time that this, and also the, on the government level, we need partnership, partnership, and partnership. We need a holistic approach so that um, the donors, uh, they feel, feel, feel compelled, uh, feel spellbound to give us more donation. We need a governance and good governance in public financing so that um, all stakeholders feel assured that the money they will give use for the purpose it was given. Also globally, um, there is a trend that the damage fund is often given to IMF or World Bank, and it is known as a clean fund, but when it is given to the victims of this, it is given as a loan, soft or high interest, I don't know, but it is given as a loan. No, it should not be given as a loan, it should be given as a donation. Also, whenever it comes to any green project, any eco project, any climate friendly project, any project that is led by youth, it is important that the qualification criteria be reduced. It is important that the financial institutions adopt some sort of leniency. So climate and green for project should be should not be uh, looked into uh, as a traditional commercial ventures because the challenge when it comes to green or climate friendly project is much more higher than the traditional business. So when it is a come to a green business, a climate friendly business, we have to consider it very very. Uh, with leniency, uh, and so that all the funds they can achieve um, uh, easily. Um, and also, these projects, they need risk backup and supervision. Uh, public sector finance is also important here. Uh, CSR fund could be an addition, but as I, as Mr. Sabe said, cannot be mainstream. The mainstream fund should come from global communities and also from the government. Um, at the end, um, I, I will not take much longer time. I think we need a separate financial scheme uh, when it comes to uh, green finance or climate finance or project finance, green project, a separate financial pattern we need, a separate financial structure we need, which is semi-government, which is which include all whole government, whole society, whole people, and of course, uh, whole sphere of life. So I think um, it, is, uh, it is very good webinar. Um, I'm sure it will be frequent in nature and more recording in that chat, and we love to contribute as a record here. Uh, a caucus, uh, we have already parliament, climate caucus, uh, the climate parliament, which is a caucus for climate related issues. And also, it is important that the more MPs involved with these issues, they raise their voice in parliament, outside parliament, within country, outside country, and then holistically face this draconian problem. Thank you. Everybody.
All right, uh, so we've, uh, we've arrived right at the end of our uh, webinar. I'd just like to go around and ask everyone to share their closing remarks. Uh, shall we start with uh, Mr. Awa? So I'd just like to thank uh, everyone uh, today and, and everyone watching also today's uh, show, especially YPF. And I just hope that uh, YPF continues uh, to bring us all together and allowing us an opportunity to participate and also uh, give our inputs as much as possible. And I wish uh, you know the delegates from Bangladesh, uh, from all sectors, uh, the best of luck um, in, in achieving or at least achieving something better than yesterday. And we're always here to be supportive and inclusive. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bloom? Thank you. Yes. Um, and um, again, I thank you for the invitation uh, to this very relevant meeting. Um, one thing I just wanted to address, and I'm using this opportunity of the closing remarks to get into that. The theme of the summit in uh, Paris is not limited to climate finance only. It's about the architecture of the financial system, about financing global issues, challenges, amongst others, climate finance. I would suggest um, that the focus of, of uh, and IPF is attending as well, I assume, in that meeting, should also be in seeing how Bangladesh could address the, the issue of, of a changing or a needed reform to the financial architecture. After all, um, the system as it is, is fragmented, as mentioned in your concept note. Um, it does not necessarily reflect the world of today, um, I think it is very important that Bangladesh as a country, as an up and coming nation economically, should take its rightful place in the world audience, not only in climate change, but also in the financial architecture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Grill? Yeah, also my thanks to YPF. It's been the first event I've joined uh, uh, and I'm joining since I joined the, the forum. So thanks a lot for that. And just to reiterate, reiterate this, I think it's important that we present Bangladesh as a part of the solution and not as a victim. Let's align the plans as discussed, um, provide fiscal incentives. And what David also said now, cannot be that we have certain goals in order to need to reach those goals, we need tech and then we have to pay uh, a lot of duties and taxes on this. I think that. That's, uh, that should be clear. Nurture more climate tech. I think that's that's important. And um, um, then we will see that we can actually leapfrog from here and show this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bro. Uh, Abir, would you like to say something? Yeah, so th that's basically good. I'll just uh, give a vote of thanks and then uh, I'll give our esteemed uh, Sabir Bhai the final words uh, for concluding remarks. I think it's, it's, it's fitting that like, you know, he end, ends the webinar. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. When my team uh, wanted to do this, we know that it was a very short notice. But even after that, we were able to um, get uh, such a diverse panelists uh, to talk about such an important issue. We had participation from three major political parties. Um, from YPF, we always try to be inclusive and bring a cross-party coalitions on pressing issues. We also had like, you know, a representation from European Union um, and, and Sebastian, uh, like, and consider you as part of YPF, but also I know that like you're running sole share. So uh, there's that too. Uh, and also Ambassador um, Masudupri has been very kind to join, uh, although she couldn't speak much due to a uh, connection problem. But let me just uh, give, take an opportunity to thank my team, uh, Anjum, Oishi, uh, Nafisa, uh, Minha, Shuvo, and everyone who has worked really hard to put this together. And we promise that uh, when we go to a Paris summit, uh, we will take um, all the rich insights and points that you have made and present that and advocate for that uh, in that platform, along with like you know others uh, who are going from Bangladesh. And also when we come back, we will circulate um, the key highlights and outcomes of that. And maybe we can also um, like you know sit together um, either virtually or um, in a physical event and discuss the outcomes and the way forward. So thank you so much, everyone. And now. Um, um, like, you know, um, I, I like to hand, hand it over to Sabir Bhai 
uh, to share concluding remarks and, and, and end this. And thank you, Sabir Bhai, for always uh, being a big champion of YPF. And um, I personally want to say that Shamim Bhai, Tabit Bhai, and Sabir Bhai are the reform pioneers we have within different political parties. I worked for World Bank for a while and also did my master's in public policy at Oxford. So I was taught that uh, for change, for reforms, you need to bring cross-party alli alliance with reform pioneers. And I think um, there is no bigger reform pioneer than the three gentlemen we have. And, and, and like Sabir Bhai, we always look up to you. And thank you so much again for joining please thank you and uh, big thanks to YPF for all of the uh, distinguished participants i think you know i feel good as a as a citizen of bangladesh because despite the diversity there is convergence in what we were talking um, and i think it shows that regardless of our political affiliation uh, there are individuals who put the interest of the country first um, i don't think we are reformists i think we are pragmatists you know we are realists and this is what has to be done and uh, it needs to be done so uh, that would be the first point the second point is you know i think paris is as uh, mr brahm also mentioned not just about finance not just about institutions it is about whether we can make a new journey whether we can make a new beginning and with any problem you know the very basic fact it's incredibly simple but the logic is powerful uh, you have to solve the problem faster than you're creating it so that has to be the message from Paris. And what does that mean in terms of uh, practical implication? It means um, we need to accelerate action. We need to heighten ambition. Uh, we need to make a commitment to no new coal. The problem is not fossil fuel emissions. The problem is fossil fuels. So there cannot be any new investment. Uh, there cannot be any subsidies for coal. You know, if we don't do that, then what we will actually be doing is we'll be creating the problem and then we'll be responding to the symptoms. We need to respond to the disease. And once we do that, then responding to the symptoms becomes a lot easier. So let us hope that Paris is actually going to be a new, a new journey in that direction. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Abhi. Thank you, Anjum, and all of the people who behind the scenes have helped us. A big thank to, to Tabith and, of course, Mr. Shamim Haider Patwari. Uh, Sebastian, thank you. Mr. Brom, we look forward to uh, taking this uh, interaction further in the days ahead. Thank you very much. <laughs>